If you've got your Bibles, turn chapter 9, verse 15. Let's pray, and then we're going to get into this. Father, you are so good to us. God, forgive us, and we repent for all the times we forget just how good you have been to us. Father, there have been times, every person in this room has been through moments in their life where they didn't think they were going to make it. But Lord God, here we still are. You working in our lives, giving us the desires and the motivations to pursue you, pursue your gospel, to be part of your people in this world, your church. Lord Jesus, I pray you'd continue that work today as we uh, move through 1 Corinthians chapter 9. May your work, may your word through your spirit do the work in our lives that needs to be done. We submit ourselves to you because we know we need you. Jesus, it is in your name we pray this prayer. And every Christian said, amen. Amen. Verse 15, now I'm going to try to focus this. First service is my trial run. I use way too many words and I say the same thing. I'm going to try to focus this a little more. So let's read verses 15 through verse 19 and then we'll talk. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. Okay, I lied. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to stop right there because this is important. Because last week, Paul just spent the the first 14 verses of chapter 9 to prove a point. He made a five-tiered logical argument for why uh, people in ministry are just like the farmer uh, of the land, like the shepherd of the field, uh, like the soldier of the city. Anybody who works should get a paid check. So what do you think the people in that church are thinking as this is being read to them in Corinth? They're thinking, okay, here's where they pull the thermometer out. Nobody's ever been to a charismatic church? You know, the, when they're raising money, they're, they, they pull the thermometer out. We need to get to here. And they keep coloring it in red until they, they, they get what they want. Nobody's ever been there. I thought that would get way more laughs. You guys are still sleeping. So they're waiting for the big ask. Okay, he's gone through all this thing about how he deserves uh, to, to have our money. So, so where's the ask? I, he probably, maybe he wants to buy a plane because uh, to shorten his traveling time. Nobody's ever been to a church in Louisiana. All the pastors have planes there for some reason. So they're, wait, they're probably waiting. But Paul now says... I didn't tell you all that. I didn't make that airtight, logical argument to try to get something out of you. So don't expect a big ask here. So, um, but I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. All right, now remember... Because if you're new or visiting, we're, we're in the middle of something. We're in the middle of a, a diatribe, a teaching that Paul is giving that is answering one question that the Corinthian church had. Now, he answers several questions, they have, but, but this one question of can we eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol. So we're right in the middle. Chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11, verse 1 are all answering that one question. So it doesn't seem like Paul's not talking about meat at all in chapter 9, but he is talking about the the right, the personal rights that we all have and why he's showing an, an example from his personal life of why it's good to lay down your rights for the sake of others at times. 
Now, just to remind you, let's show that slide, the yes or no slide. This is what's going on through chapter 8 and through chapter 11. Can we eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols? The answer, yes and no. In certain situations, it's going to be okay for you. Because it's based not on scripture, but uh, because uh, the Bible allows us to eat meat. So there's no scriptural command. We can't eat meat from a place where they might not be Christians. There's no, there's no rule against that. However, there are certain situations because of weaker consciences of others that this would be wrong for you to do. You don't want to hurt a weaker brother or sister and you certainly don't want to participate. Paul in chapter 10 just lays it out. No Christian should ever be participating in idolatry or idol worship. That's clear no. But the meat that comes from that idol worship in some circumstances, stay away from it. In some circumstances, it would be okay for you who have strong consciences. All right, so all that wrapped into, he starts talking about how he has the right to get paid, but now he's saying, but I've never taken that right. What's the point? How, how does this connect with this? Well, two reasons from what we just read. Number one, now Paul's not against taking money for his traveling, for his ministry, for his missions. We know uh, that the, the churches in Macedonia gave him a, a large sums of money for charitable work at the church in Jerusalem and for, for traveling expenses. It was just as expensive. I mean, three missionary journeys. It was just as expensive back then to travel as it is today. Shoes wore out. Uh, you had to eat. You had to find lodging, places to stay. It was expensive. So Paul's not against taking money. But he said, I didn't do it around you to prove two points, two big ideas. Number one, I never took anything from you because woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. He said, First off, if I was just a guy chasing my dream and doing the work I wanted to do, it would be a completely different scenario. But I'm not just out chasing my dream, trying to build my kingdom. I was knocked off my horse by Jesus, and he has commanded me. I'm not doing this of my own volition or of my own will. It is Christ himself who has called me to this. Every, almost every letter Paul writes, he begins with, I Paul, and the Greek word he uses is doulos, which most of your Bibles translate as servant. But that word is most commonly translated as servant sounds nice. So I get why we translate it that way. But what he's really saying is I, Paul, a slave of Christ. I don't get paid for this work. I didn't take anything from you because I have to do this work because it's what my master sent me to do. Woe is me if I don't do this. The second reason that Paul never took anything from Corinth, he did from other churches, but not Corinth. Why? Because of Corinth. When we preached through 1 Corinthians way back in 2009, we called this series Christians Gone Wild. Because <laughs> Corinth's a hot mess. I'm in this church. Are they Christians? Yes. Is Paul thankful for the grace of the cross displayed in their lives? Yes. But Corinth is a crazy city. It's a sexually immoral city. It's a wealthy city. And the people, remember the first couple chapters, there's so many divisions among you. Why? Because you're bringing in this, this wisdom that works out there. The dog eat, dog, do whatever you can. The ends justifies the means to get what you want. Doesn't sound like any culture we're familiar with, right? That was great. And they were bringing that worldly wisdom into the church. There were power plays going on in this church. When we get to 12, 13, and 14 uh, and talking about spiritual gifts, we're, we're going to see that people were using spiritual gifts that God gives for the good of his entire church. They were using them to jockey for position and influence within the church. Look at me. I'm so spiritual. Everybody, come to me with your questions. I have, I'm the Bible answer man, Hank Kandereff, or whatever his name was, old radio guy. I'm by myself right now, aren't I? 
There's power plays going on. Now, I know you've never been to a church where that happens. But God's people, man, sometimes we just are so blind and so dumb. Each and every one of us, remember, we're part of the problem. It's not just them. It's us too. So God gives his word through his apostles to humble us, to make us realize, just like Paul, from his own personal life, yes, I have rights. And isn't it true? Listen to me. Sometimes it's good to stand for your rights. Amen? Right? There's a time for everything under heaven, Solomon says. There's a time for war. There's a time for peace. There's a time for love. There's even a time for hate. So we've got we've to stick close to our Bibles because we're going to be called to stand firm at times and fight for our faith. But if you look back at your last year, your last two years, and all you're doing is standing with your chest out fighting You need to add a little bit of this because everything we've ever seen in my lifetime has been every movie, every song is be all you can be, do what you want, you precious little unicorn, sunfish, you are amazing. You be you. But sometimes being us is the last thing we should do. Sometimes we need to be something better Everybody look at your spouse right now and say, sometimes I need to be something better. (laughs) Ladies, you say it too. It's not just the men that need to do that. (laughs) This is Paul's point. Of course we can all beat our chest and I have rights and, and this is the way it should look for me. But sometimes in disputable situations like this meat issue, It's better to love the brothers. with. It's better to lay down our rights. Yes, we deserve them. Yes, it should be. But sometimes it's better to love your brother, to love your sister for the sake of the gospel. For though, verse 19, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant of all that I might win more of them. It's that verse that Jesus, came out of Jesus' own mouth in the Gospels. He said, I want you, and I've been quoting it in these sermons because it's so germane to this topic of these disputable matters between Christians. Well, I homeschool. Well, we send our kids to public school. Well, you're going to hell. As a homeschool person, I can say that. (laughs) Self-righteous, man. The way we do it is better than the way you do it. Some, how can there be unity in Christ when we're fighting over these peripheral things, these, these individual perspectives that we have? Always thinking we're better and more right than the person next to us. Sometimes it's better just to lay down. Jesus said, deny yourself. Hear me. Christian church, what what would the difference be in the church if we followed the words of Christ? Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. That doesn't sound like build your own kingdom to me. It sounds like build his kingdom at the cost of your own blood, your own sweat. And I don't know about you, I've been looking. I, I have searched everywhere to try to find that Serta Posturepedic cross. Right? Lightweight, because it's got aluminum springs in it. It's got extra padding. But this is so light and easy. This is awesome. But the only cross I've ever found in my life has been solid wood and heavy And it brings sweat to your brow, to to lug. And it puts splinters in your back. It's rough. But this is the life. It's what the word Christian means. Little Christ to deny yourself. What Jesus didn't come down and sit on a throne, even though he could and should have. He's God of all things. But he came down and he made himself the least. He made himself a servant. 
He denied himself for the sake of salvation for others. And as Christians, we are to be like in 1 John 2, 6, those who claim to live in him must walk as he walked. This is what Paul is saying to this church. Listen, I hear you with the questions about meat and you've got your argument and you've got your argument. And listen, you're both right in certain areas and you're both wrong in certain areas. So don't beat your chest and say, I'm right and I can do what I want. It's all about me. No, see the reality of the people beside you. They're important to God. People are important to Jesus. It's why he died. For the glory of the Father's will in saving us, his people. People matter. There's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers where they named all the people and all the tribes. Why? Because people matter to God. Think about a church that practices The Bible says don't be a hearer only. Be a doer. A person who hears James, the book of James in the Bible says, a person who hears and then doesn't do is like a person who looks in the mirror and then turns around and forgets what he looks like. It doesn't do us any good. Don't just be hearers, be doers. Now watch this, verse 20. To the Jews I became as a Jew. In order to win Jews, to those under the law, I became as one under the law. Quotation marks, though not being myself under the law, my conscience is clean. I am righteous in Christ, not through the law. So I'm not really under the law, but to the Jew who is under the law, I myself become as a Jew under the law, that I might win those under the law. You know, it was Paul's custom to begin ministry in the towns he went in the synagogue. The synagogue we know from Josephus served many purposes in the communities. A school was held. Think about it. Ministry, the sacrificial system, the priesthood was all in Jerusalem. But what if you were a Jew who was a refugee? The diaspora was real. The Roman emperor kicked all the Jews out of Rome. They they were all over the the place. They weren't just in Jerusalem. Priscilla and Aquila are in Corinth because of that diaspora. So what do you do if you're not near the temple? A local synagogue was established with a leader of that synagogue. But that leader was not uh, like a pastor in a church today. He was more of an administrator because everything, all of Jewish life happened in the synagogue. Uh, Weddings were uh, done there, communal meals were done there, school was done there, political rallies and discussions were happening in the synagogue. Charity was given and dispersed through the synagogue. Lots of stuff was going on, lots to administrate. But there was also the daily prayer and daily teaching from the scrolls, the Torah, And a synagogue, by the way, was lucky to have a couple books of the Old Testament because handwritten, you had to be educated. You had to have the time to to copy these things. The Jews were very strict about that whole transcription process. So it took a long time to produce a scroll of the Old Testament before Gutenberg's printing press, which, by the way, he put together and invented to get the Bible into more people's hands. So they would just have a couple scrolls that they would read from. And it was local elders, local Jewish elders. And as elder, I don't mean pastor, I mean gray hair. That's what the word actually means, gray hair. The respected older Jewish men would would do the teaching in the synagogue or a traveling rabbi or a traveling teacher would come. And that's where Paul started, following those customs, going through the purse. He didn't bust into the synagogue and say, why are you guys still doing this? This is dumb. You're doing it all wrong. What did he do? He went through the process. He did everything the Jews were doing so that when it was time for him as a traveling teacher to speak, he got to share the gospel. But my favorite part from Paul's life, I gave three examples for each of these in the first service. You're only getting one each. So to the Jew, I became a Jew. Let's look at Paul in Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through 24. 
Paul practiced what he preached. You can see it in his life. He doesn't mind doing things that he's not bound by conscience to do in order to reach more people. Now, this is when he goes to Jerusalem. He's in Acts. He goes to Jerusalem. He's been on some missionary journeys. God has been using him and Barnabas in reaching Gentiles. But now he's meeting with James, the brother, the half-brother of Jesus, who is the, the lead pastor, the campus pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And he's meeting with him and all the other elders that are with James. And here's the conversation. This is so, man, I love the Bible. It's so real. It's so right now. When we had come to Jerusalem... The brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. So they're there at the church in Jerusalem. A church that in one sermon Peter preached, 3,000 people got saved. In his second sermon, 5,000 people got saved. Man, I want to be more like Peter, can I, I need to tap into that Holy Spirit uh, that, that was on Peter because uh, people were just coming to Jesus through that ministry. This is a huge church, biggest church that we know of in the New Testament. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So Paul and Barnabas are telling James and all the elders all the good stuff that's been happening, all the churches that have been planted. And when they heard it, they glorified God. Now, just in case you don't know, the biggest problem that faced the New Testament church is the same problem this meat thing has brought into the church. Christ was a Jew who came to the Jews just like the Old Testament prophesied. Now his plan was always to graft in the Gentiles, everybody else, the Romans, uh, uh, the, the Ethiopians, the, uh, uh, the Egyptians, the, the Greeks, all Gentiles. If non-Jew means Gentile. So God was going to graft all the Gentiles in and make one new humanity in Christ. That's what the book of Ephesians is about. A new humanity in Christ. No longer Jew, no longer Gentile. One person, one church in Christ. But the Jews were having a hard time with this Gentile uh, uh, influx, because guess what? The Gentiles, they didn't talk the same as the Jews. They didn't eat or have the same diet the Jews had. They didn't listen to the same music. They didn't watch the same TV shows. It was a completely, it was a cultural clash. They didn't know what to do about it. You, it's clear throughout the New Testament. You see, brother, so they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. So they're Christians now, but they are all zealous for the law. They've been raised on the law of Moses. They've got the Torah memorized in their heads from grade school. So yeah, the law is really important to them still. So, and they have been told about you, Paul. There's rumors. Aren't you glad we're not like that old church in the first century? Nobody around here rumors and talks about anybody else. They've been told, Paul, everybody knows you're here. And they've been told that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. Listen, Paul has found something better than the traditions of the Jewish people. He's found the Christ, the Messiah. Remember in Philippians chapter 3, just write that down. As Paul surrenders his rights here, he was the Hebrew of Hebrews, the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was from Tarsus, the most educated center of scholastic wisdom on planet Earth at the time. Library bigger than that of Alexandria at this time. He was taught by Gamaliel. He'd been all the right places, met all the right people, had all the right stamps of approval, had all the right trophies. But he counted it all. Guys, if you were around when we did Philippians, you'll remember that mug we gave you. Scuba lung happens. He counted all of that. All of that Jewishness, all of that culture, all of that Stuff that he dedicated his life to as a steaming pile that a cow leaves in a field. That's what that word means. That's why scuba lung happens was our mug. It's funny. 
And he's teaching other people. That stuff's not, that stuff is not, that's not where salvation comes from. Salvation is found in no, no other name but Jesus Christ. The only way to the Father is through Christ, his perfect work, his perfect life, his sacrificial death is where our righteousness, our salvation, our justification comes from. He's not bound up in this stuff anymore, but people were still bound up in it in Jerusalem. So what does James tell Paul to do? What then is to be done? How can we fix this problem? People are divided. People have arguments on each side. Both sound right. People are wishy-washy, back and forth. What's to be done? They will certainly, oh, they will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. This is a Nazarite vow. It'll become clear in a moment. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance to the law. Remember our text. To the Jews, I became a Jew. To those under the law, I became under the law. Even though I'm not really under the law, I'm in Christ. But to them, I became as they are so that I may reach them. So what does Paul do in this situation? Now, you, you may not know anything about a Nazarite vow. Most Christians know Nazarite vow. They instantly think Samson. There's somebody else in the Old Testament that, that God commanded to take a Nazarite vow. His name was Samuel. The fact that those stories are so prevalent, and that's what we know about the Nazarite vow, uh, is because those two issues are super unique. God, they were vows that God made people take that lasted their entire lives. According to Numbers chapter 6, that's not the common. Nazarite vows were common in the ancient world. Because in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 21, there are five things. Number one, to take a vow meant you wanted to be closer to God. You wanted to be set apart, sanctified for God. Uh, so the Nazarite vow had to be voluntary, number one. Anybody could take it. Both men and women could take a Nazarite vow. There needed to be a clear point of time where the vow ended. The most common Nazarite vow in the ancient world was 30 days, although some did a year, 60 days, 90 days. You had to figure that out up front. I'm going to do this vow for this long because there were, number four, requirements for the vow. Three found in Numbers chapter six. First, you can't cut your hair. Number two, you can't be around a dead body. Even if you're in a vow and your father dies or your mother dies, you can't go to the funeral. You can't be around anything dead because that makes you unclean. So cut hair, um, can't be around a dead body, and you can't drink any fruit of the vine. And that didn't just mean wine. That meant just unfermented grape juice, anything from the vine you could not partake of for the length of your vow. Then at the end, when your vow comes to an end, that's when you go and present yourself to the priest and they shave your head. All that hair you grew during the vow, they shave it and they put it on an altar with an animal sacrifice. And that ends and concludes the vow that you made unto God. Paul knows there is no part of this Nazarite vow that brings true salvation from God to a person. He knows only Christ and his work. But what does he do at the request of James and the elders of the church to prevent barriers that the Jews in Jerusalem are going to have with Paul who's saying you don't have to be circumcised? He puts himself, on, not because he has to. He could have beat his chest and he could have said, you guys just don't understand the gospel. But how are they ever if nobody's going to submit themselves to those customs so that they can earn trust to proclaim that gospel? This is why Paul says, man, sometimes it's better to lay down your rights for the sake of the gospel, to the Jew, I became a Jew. Look at verse 21. To, the, to those outside the law, the pagans, the Gentiles, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside of the law. Acts chapter 17, guys, if you'll put it up. 
Paul ate and drank and sang and fellowshiped. That's a Bible word for hung out. Paul knew the pagan poets. He quotes Epimenides in scripture. He quotes Greek thinkers and song. He knew their culture. What does a missionary do? If God, they feel God calls them to Chad, Africa or, or, or uh, somewhere in South America or, or somewhere in Europe. Because Lord knows Europeans need Jesus too. We need some German missionaries, don't we? We need some Russian military uh, missionaries. Well, that's a crap storm right now. What, what does a missionary do? They don't just show up and be, hey, I got the answer. Everybody listen to me. Because everybody there is going, we don't understand what you're saying. You got to learn the language. You got to learn the culture. You don't, do you shake hands or do you bow, right? It's different, different places you go. So you don't go and say, you guys bow, but you really shake hands. It's in the Bible somewhere. You shake hands. You don't try to change that stuff. Because what's more important than that stuff? The gospel. So you got to find ways in how they live. That's what a good missionary does. They find ways to bring about the gospel conversation through the culture. This is what Paul does to those not under the law. I became as not one under the law. This is when Paul's in Athens. It's at the Areopagus, Mars Hill. It's a famous place. Athens is the center. It's Plato's from Athens. Right? All these great thinkers are from Athens. Socrates. It's, it's the center of scholastic, philosophical thought in the world. All the smart guys, they love to hear themselves talk, and they love to hear others talk in Athens, which is why on this big rock called the Areopagus, they're constantly listening to every new thing out there, every new thought that's out there. And so that's where Paul finds himself. And standing in the midst of the Areopagus, he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. As Paul is walking through Athens, there are statues and monuments and altars everywhere. And Paul doesn't freak out. He is studying them. He's like, oh my God, you guys are pagans. Get me out of here. You're going to taint me with your paganness. That's why Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. It's a different story. We don't have time. But he's like, I see, you guys are very religious people. You got a God for everything. You got a God for love. You got a God for war. You got a God for uh, the field and the plants and fertility. You got, you got God's for, you got a God for using the bathroom over here. Lord, I ate too much cheese. Help me not be constipated. (laughs) They had a God for everything. They were so superstitious. They were afraid they might have missed a God. So they even had a, a, an altar that people could worship the unknown God. Don't want to offend you, but we don't know you. And this is where Paul sees his chance. If you're not studying, if you're not in the culture, if you're not permeated by it, you never find these ways to bring the gospel. I passed along. You're very religious. I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown. This, I, hey, I got good news. You guys realize there's a God you missed. You've even got an inscription to the God you don't know. Great news. I know him. Let me tell you about him. And he, pre- man, read the rest of this chapter. Say he preaches the gospel and people get saved. Praise God. To the Jew, I become a Jew. To those not under the law, I become as one not under the law. Look here. In terms of this meat thing in the church, to the weak, I became weak. That's talking about not weak physically, but weak in conscience. Did you know when I got saved, I wouldn't play with playing cards for like two years? You know why? Because my mom is from a, a church background called the Mountain Assembly. If you come from Pentecostal backgrounds, here's Pentecostal, here's Mountain Assembly. Low Valley Appalachian people. And every man, 
opening your eyes during prayer was a sin that would send you straight to hell. And playing cards, man, even if you're not gambling, there's no chips on the table. You're playing hearts. You're going to hell. My conscience was weak. I didn't know any better. I just knew I loved Jesus, and that's what I'd been taught. So I played Rook, because Rook were the cards that Christians played with. <laughs> but, man, when you study your Bible and you, you hear about this freedom in Christ, right? God takes weak brothers and sisters and grows them up through good, solid gospel teaching. So now I even play poker with friends. I am free in Christ. But if somebody is offended, guess what? I don't play poker in front of my mom's people. Because that would be a barrier to everything I know about the gospel that I can share with them. Why would I do anything that would turn them off or offend them? To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people. That by all means, I might save some. Man, the heart of God in Paul's message of self-denial. Hey, I get it. You have a blog. You have to have something to say. You got to put yourself out there. I hope you make piles of money. And I hope you pay your tithes. (laughs) But just remember, it's not about you. It's about the people that God has placed all around us. And yes, there are times where we have to stand and say, this is right and this is wrong. The Bible's clear on right and wrong and what sin is. is." But this other stuff, whether you homeschool or go to public school. Oh, you send your kids to public school? That's nice of you to give your kids to Caesar. Right? We We gotta chill out. Because everybody comes from different levels of conscience. And we've got to be sensitive to that for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the unity in the church, which Christ died for. It's Unity in the church is important. Read Ephesians 4. It's important that we're not two, we're one new humanity in Christ. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. I got six minutes. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Take this teaching about self-denial and laying your rights down for the sake of others, for the sake of other Christians, for the sake of non-believers too, for the sake of those with weak consciences. You're free in your conscience, but some are weak and bound up in theirs. So if they don't listen to secular music and you invite them over for dinner, play Carmen or something. I don't know any Christian music. (laughs) Play stuff. Don't offend just to prove your rightness. Because that's really, it's a pride thing. We're so right and we want people to know how right we are. Paul says there's no place for that. The gospel is more important than you being right. The gospel is more important than your reputation. The gospel is more important uh, than your self-image. Man, this is a good sermon. This is way better than first service. Run this race like you're the person that's going to win. Try hard. Discipline your body to be this way for the sake of many. I mean, it's the guy, it's what Jesus did. He didn't come down and put a crown on his head and say, worship me, even though he could have and should have. It's his right. He's king of all. But instead he came down and he made himself the least He made himself God, king of all, served, washed feet, died on a cross that we deserved. Paul says, live that same way. Why wouldn't you? For the sake of many, run like you're going to be the one that wins. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we an imperishable. You had the... it's me and the games. I'm saying that wrong. It's, I can't remember. Uh, you, I had the, did you know the Olympics were going on in the days of Jesus? We're still doing some of the same games today that were being done thousands of years ago. Were started thousands of years ago. Isthmus. I, I forgot. 
There's, there, there's certain games in Corinth that weren't the Olympics, but they were just like the Olympics. All these people are beating their bodies and disciplining themselves to win these events where all they get is some twigs that have been pulled off a bush and fashioned into a little halo to put on their head. As soon as you pluck those twigs, they die and they're going to decay. They're going to go. They're not, not, none of those. We've never found one of those wreaths from those ancient games. Why? Because they're biodegradable, they're, they decay, they were living things, and they decayed. They're not around anymore. You work so hard to get this imperishable stuff. Why not work harder for that which is imperishable? Man, what, wouldn't it be awesome? And none of us will really know what difference we ever made for Christ in this life until we get to heaven and, and see people that we didn't even mean to. But somehow we influenced for Jesus and their lives were changed as a result. I'm thinking of that old, not Ray Charles, what's the, what's the guy? Anyway, I don't want to, he, he turned out to be a bad guy anyway. But he sang that song, thank you for giving to the Lord, I'm alive, that was saved. I don't sing. There are imperishable weights of glory. For eternity, that's what we spend our lives fighting for, racing for. And watch this, I love this verse. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Paul says, man, I have trained and I have disciplined myself. When I throw a punch, it's like George Foreman. It connects with what I'm trying to punch. I'm not like a high school girl fight. The only good thing about a high school girl fight is when they start taking their earrings out, you're like, oh, it's on. <laughs> but then the fight happens and you're like, oh, that's terrible. I can't watch. Because they're just, it's like Dwight and Michael Scott on The Office when they spar that one time. It's just like nothing is close. Paul says, if you're going to box, be, learn how to punch and learn how to connect. You don't want to miss. You want to punch and knock out. And what are we trying to punch? Our pride, ourselves. He says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Listen, our work does not save us, but those who claim to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. We have a job to do. We have a responsibility in our, we can't help what's happened in the past. We don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but we are responsible as God's people for right now. This gift of breath that God has given us right now. We are to stand against evil for sure. But when it comes to weak brothers and other Christians and even unbelievers, man, to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus, doing whatever it takes that more would come to know him. This is how our lives should be spent. One of my favorite quotes, when I had an office, it was on the wall in my office. It's in a box now, but I hope to have an office soon. Again, it'll be back on my wall. My wife gave it to me. I quoted it all the time. She gave it to me many years ago. You can spend your life any way you want, but you can only spend it once. At the end, are you going to be proud of the wreath that decays and is gone as you leave this world? Or will you be looking forward to the rewards of a life well spent in self-denial and loving others for the sake of the gospel that lasts forever? Let's pray. Father, you are good. And thank you for grace. Thank you for the righteousness of Christ that saves us. We are a saved people. But continue our sanctification as you grow us into better people than we are. Because all of us have lots of room to grow. Thank you for that grace, as well as the grace you provide in salvation. It is in Jesus' name every Christian said, amen. amen.